to get the, the vaccine. And I believe that's so important to help us minimize the numbers of um, people that are testing positive, people that are having issues, and people that have died. And we definitely want to be a part of helping people get educated and aware of how deadly this thing is. So we definitely have invited um, professionals and top-notch people who have worked with individuals and who have just taken the ball and run with it when COVID hit. So um, the, our speakers are people that are health workers, people that work at health departments, people that work with people. And most importantly, you know, they've definitely been picked to help spread the word so that we can get um, a hold of this pandemic and minimize our numbers so that we can keep moving forward and eventually, you know, get rid of this pandemic. So we have the professionals on the line here today and I'm so glad that everybody was able to accompany us. And what I will do is turn it over to our CEO and president who will introduce herself. Um, she is Theodia Gillespie and she will take it from here. So thank you, Ms. Gillespie. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you so much for putting this poem on. So we're recording the um, this um, Zoom um, kind of form, information form so we can share um, to the public. Um, this is a way to really spread the need of addressing this pandemic and what's needed for our community. And that's one is to be, to, be vac to get the vaccination. So um, thank you so much ladies um, for uh, agreeing to do this, taking out your, from your busy schedule. Um, Yushi, it's always good to see you, my dear friend <laughs> from the Kane County Health Department and all of you who are here uh, spreading the word, the importance of getting this information out to our community. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not able to be with you all for the entire um, information session, but I just want to say thank you. Um, thank to uh, Representative Underwood for bringing a representative to um, show that it's not just um, an issue that is concerned locally, but federally, that we really need to get this message out. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much for joining in and being able to share this information because what we're going to do is why it's being recorded and we know that a number of people are not able to participate but to put it on our website to put it out to the general population so they know the importance of getting vaccine getting the vaccine being vaccinated so thank you and enjoy and look forward to seeing you guys again take care thank you thank you Ms. Gillespie yeah, again, you know, this event is, is geared toward our minorities and people that are really hesitant to get this vaccine. So we wanted to really focus on our Black and Brown community, but also other minorities as well who have been very resistant um, because of myths, because of um, things that people are saying as far as what can happen and you know, definitely, you know, a lot of people have become paranoid because of conversations that have gone on amongst people. So we just want to hopefully clear up a lot of the things that people have been misinformed about. So again, that's why we have people such as our great presenters that will be able to hopefully dispel some of those things. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker, and that will be uh, Ms. Vanita Voss. She is from the Will County Health Department. She's the Vaccine Equity Manager, and she's out of Joliet, so she is Region 7. So I will turn it over to Ms. Voss so she can give us some information on what she has encountered. So go ahead, Ms. Voss. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for inviting us to participate and share what's going on in Will County. I know that we're seeing some of the, um, you know, same hesitancy, uh, you know, some of the same kind of vaccination numbers and rates um, across many of our counties and federally as well. So I am going to go ahead and share my screen. Just bear with me for a moment. And because it looks like we have some storms rolling in, just saying if, you know, 
get knocked out or anything like that, I'll jump back in. <laughs> we'll keep it moving. Okay. All right. So we started this We Will Win campaign, um, of course, to raise awareness and educate and reach out, um, you know, to our Will County community uh, regarding the COVID-19 vaccine. So I just wanted to share um, some of the numbers we're seeing here. Um, this is our, these are our vaccination rates that we're seeing. And I just kind of highlighted, since we're talking about the black and brown community, um, our Hispanic and black populations. Um, actually, our Asian community is doing very well in proportion to our representation, Asian representation in the county. Um, if you see other um, and unknown, um, you know, it's difficult to get all of the data that we need. I know that we've struggled as a state to get a lot of these, you know, racial, you know, this racial and ethnic, um, these demographics and this data, because some people are very uncomfortable with sharing that information. Um, so it makes it a little difficult. Um, and that goes into, you know, a lot of the, you know, hesitancy and the mistrust in general. Um, but we're looking at about 13.1% vaccinated in our county for our Latinx population. And our Latinx population makes up about 18.2% in the county. And then for our Black community, we're at about 8.5%. Um, and we make up about 12.2% in the county. Um, so just looking at those numbers, I know we're, you know, they're, they're pretty alarming um, because we really do need to increase the vaccination rates in um, these demographics. Oops, sorry, going the wrong direction. So when we look at the confirmed and probable cases and we take a look at our black African-American community, we're at about, you know, almost 9%. But then we, when we look down here, at the deaths by demographics, we see we're at over 15%. So it, it shows that uh, this is really impacting the Black community and Will County in a major way. Um, and then as well, when we take a look at our um, Hispanic population, our Latinx population, about 15, um, you know, almost 15.6% confirmed probable cases. And then 14%, a little over 14% as far as the death rates. So, you know, just going back a little bit and looking at that slide again at those vaccination rates, see, we still have a lot of work to do. And these, mem these numbers, you know, mirror what's happening nationally as well with our Black community. And earlier today, um, you know, I saw various news articles from different news outlets stating that with this new variant, with the Delta variant, it is hitting our young people and Black Americans the hardest. And if that's not an eye opener, I, you know, I don't know what is. Um, this is, you know, it's scary. Um, you know, we really need to increase the vaccination rates. And we see even as the state is opening up, you know, there, there are pockets where a lot of our, our black and brown communities where our populations are living, right? So, you know, I'm sure this resonates in other counties as well. So there are certain zip codes or certain census, census tracts that we really need to, um, you know, target in our outreach and education efforts because there are going to be pockets of, you know, you know our population that are unvaccinated that are, you know, going to see a surge if we don't get this under control and get our community vaccinated. Here, I just wanted to show, um, you know, the read the, you know, I know the letters are really tiny, um, <laughs> but, you know, just showing where some of our vaccination locations are, of course, at the health department and our community health center. Um, we have mass vac sites at our, you know, old Toys R Us building in Joliet. Um, in Moni and Wilmington. Moni and Wilmington were identified as other areas where we could do some additional outreach. And we're going to be moving away as the state is doing from the mass vac sites and focusing on pop-ups in specific neighborhoods, making it more accessible for our community. Um, down here, you see in this tiny print here, sorry about that, but um, I tried to squeeze everything um, in the interest of time and, and getting through this, but we're also um, making homebound visits as well to make sure that uh, for our homebound community that we're getting them vaccinated as well. 
So just to you know, talk about some of those um, barriers, right? And some of the reasons for hesitancy. Um, we know mistrust, right? The past history um, with you know, not only the government, but in medicine, especially when we're talking about African-Americans and um, our Native American communities, we know that there has been um, sterilization, there have been experiments that make us um, you know, more hesitant right, to seek medical care in general. And then we know for our Latinx community, um, you know, being undocumented or um, not having, you know, and this is, you know, across other races as well, not having health insurance, you know, make these groups also very hesitant to seek medical care as well. So when we're talking about the vaccine and we're talking about that history and we're, you know, talking about Tuskegee and some other things um, that we're hearing out in the community, um, we know we really have to do some work, right? We have to, number one, acknowledge that, you know, this happened and this, this occurred, right? But, you know, we also need to have, um, you know, continue that education and have an understanding of what happened at that time. I've heard a lot of uh, misinformation about Tuskegee. You know, for example, some feel that, um, you know, they were intentionally exposed to syphilis and that wasn't the case. It was the treatment that was withheld to see how it responded, what, you know, it was going to do to their bodies, um, which was ex extremely unfair, right? Um, and I heard a doctor put it in, um, an African-American doctor put it in, in this perspective, and it just really hit me. You know, for those that are talking about Tuskegee, um, the Tuskegee study and, and other situations, you know, in that situation, the treatment was withheld, right, from those men, unfairly withheld. We're in a situation now where we have a vaccine that can help save lives and prevent severe disease and hospitalization, severe complications and hospitalization, right? Um, so when we're volunteer, voluntarily um, refusing to get vaccinated, it's almost like we're putting ourselves in the same position that they were in. Where they were involuntarily, right, um, in that position because they didn't have access to the treatment. Here, we have a vaccine that can help and we're voluntarily saying, we're not going to do this. And so we need to recognize that, you know, there's, there's not a different vaccine based upon race. Okay, everybody has access, you know, to the, the three vaccines that have been authorized, Pfizer, or, um, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson or Janssen, right? And so this is impacting our black and brown communities at such a disproportionate level for so many different reasons, you know, based upon those historical factors, based upon, um, you know, the stressors and the lifestyle, being essential workers, um, you know, having those, um, those diseases that make us predisposed to, you know, more complications when it comes to COVID-19. Um, you know, so we need to work on that education piece and acknowledging what happened, but also working to move forward and to rebuild that trust, not only when it comes to vaccination, but when it comes to healthcare in general. Um, we're hearing about other conspiracy theories, such as there's a tracking system in the vaccine. Um, I, another physician that I spoke with, you know, put it in this way. He said, you know, do you have one of these? And, you know, your cell phone, right? Um, you know, are you on social media? Do you have a credit card? You know, th these are ways that you're already being tracked by, you know, different companies, for example. Um, but they're not tracking you through the vaccine. There's no, you know, chip that's inserted through the vaccine. You know, a chip would be much too large um, to, you know, um, deliver in this method. There's no chip, you're not being tracked. There's confusion about cost. Um, you know, there are some, you know, we're trying to get the information out there that it's free. Um, you know, one caveat though, those who have insurance, the insurance companies can bill an administrative fee. That doesn't trickle down to the patient, to the individual. You're not going to be billed for this. Um, you know, you don't have to pay for this. This is something that the insurance company can do, but it's, it's not a cost to you. Is That's the message that we're getting out there. It is free. Um, we've had some state religious reasons. And so we've talked to pastors and we've talked to priests and other faith leaders um, to get that message out there about, you know, not only clarifying some of the statements, especially from like the Catholic perspective on um, utilizing certain vaccines, um, but, you know, from a religious perspective, you know, 
what I hear over and over again, right, is that, you know, our, our faith, um, you know, lends us to, to look out for our fellow neighbor, right, to look out for our, our brothers and sisters, our neighbors. Um, and so, you know, getting vaccinated is, is another expression of, you know, that faith and that love that we have for others to help protect them as well. Um, language barriers and commuting, communicating this factual information and communicating, you know, from a scheduling perspective and where to find these locations. Um, side effects. There are minor side effects, but we know that there are some that are concerned about having to take a day off. Um, we have to address those as well. Technology gaps and being able to schedule transportation to and from vaccination sites. Um, some feel that there are antibodies, right? They already were infected with COVID-19. They feel that their antibodies will protect them. We're talking about immunity and antibodies for maybe as little as three months, you know, maybe a little longer. But you have to also factor in that we have variants now because this has been circulating throughout our communities, right? So you may have, a, you know, a little bit of protection from that original strain, but you're not factoring in the variants and the vaccines can help with that. We have some that want to wait and see. And my you know, response to them is you've waited and you've seen. So now you see people around you have you know, been vaccinated and they're not having these you know, terrible reactions or you know, what I'm hearing in, in, in some places from some people, you know, none of us has, have turned into zombies, right? So you know, you've waited and now it's time to act and get vaccinated. Um, we're also hearing that, oh, it's not FDA approved. Uh, they're mm -hmm. waiting for full authorization. Another um, very wise and clever physician, you know, said that he shares with his patients, you know, he says, hey, do you take vitamins or other supplements? And, you know, most of them respond, yeah, yeah you know, I do. Well, if you look on the bottle of those vitamins and supplements, those vitamins and supplements have not been tested and they're not FDA approved. These vaccines have been authorized, they've gone through the process. And, and because this is a pandemic, because this is an emergency, they received emergency authorization. You know, we've had the studies, we've had studies, you know, with individuals that represented multiple races and ethnicities, and it is deemed safe and effective. Um, you know, so just trying to dispel some of those myths that are out there and the misinformation that's out there, um, you know, through education and trying to reach our communities. Um, you know, one that I also want to point out is that they feel that children, you know, are immune, don't get seriously ill, and do not need to be vaccinated. And we know that we didn't see um, the incidence of, you know, positivity rates in, in children. Um, they tend not to have severe illness, um, you know, or complications, um, you know, not a lot of hospitalizations. But the reality is that sometimes that does happen. Um, and I'm going to, I hope that I'll be able to share just this quick one minute um, clip um, from one of our Will County families, uh, Dakota Morgan, is a 15 year old um, from Bolingbrook and healthy student athlete. Um, unfortunately, she lost her life due to COVID and her family sharing her story in efforts to bring about awareness that, you know, although, um, there are reports that it's 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 rare for this to happen to children. It it does happen, right? And no one wants their child to be that you know that one or that handful or you know that number, right? Um, and as her parents state, they don't want anyone else to have to experience something like this. Um, before I kind of close with her story. Um, I also wanna share some other things we're doing and working with our community and faith-based organizations. Our, I mean, our community and faith-based organizations are you know, so powerful and so knowledgeable and they have the ear and the trust of the community. They are absolutely our trusted voices. And so we know that we have to work directly with them in order to be able to reach the community. Um, we have some town halls ourselves that, you know, we will be uh, hosting. 
Um, we have our first Latinx uh, virtual town hall on the 29th. We're aiming for one for our African-American community mid-July, for women who have questions about fertility and menstrual cycles in late July. Men in our county are getting vaccinated at lower rates, so we need to talk about that and the importance of our men seeking care, medical care in general, right, and preventive care. And then parents, you know, back to school time, There, you know, there's already a lot of questions about vaccinations and the progress on vaccinations for our um our younger children as well. So we will definitely be providing that education and those resources. And these are just um, our flyers for our upcoming um, town hall next week. And then we also conducted a survey because we can kind of assume what's going on, you know, why people don't want to, um, you know, get vaccinated, but we wanted to hear directly from our residents. So we have about, you know, over 3000 surveys and, and that's, major for, you know, one of our community surveys. Um, and the reasons that I had on this other slide are basically, you know, the reasons um, that individuals in our community, our community members are expressing why they are hesitant or resistant to getting vaccinated. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing for just a moment because for okay. some reason we have to do that for the video. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, it just, oh, there's a video that. too. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, because I'm sorry, I don't, I don't mean to cut you off, but I know um, Lauren Underwood has sent the representative and I wanted her to be able to go next as well because she has to leave, but how? It's one wanna, minute. Okay, one that's minute fine. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So I will try my best. If for some reason it does not work for us, then I will just provide you the link and you can do it afterward. Are you able to see this? Okay. And let me know if you can hear it in just a moment. The only thing that I wish I could do different was get that vaccine for her. I don't want any parent to feel this boy Nobody should have to feel this is the worst thing in the world, especially when you know you did everything you could to protect them. If you look at our she did the option to show her and her Anita, do you have the volume turned up? I do. And so it, this happens sometimes with videos. So I will send, in the chat, I will send you a link where everybody can view not only that one minute, um, but especially the full video. Um, and there is going to be a vaccination clinic in her honor on Saturday. Um, at Humphrey Middle School. I'll send the link to that as well. Um, but in closing, I'd just like to say, you know, we encourage everyone, everyone that's eligible 12 and up to get vaccinated. It is so important, um, you know, not only individually, so you can protect yourself, but you can protect others as well. Um, and so that we can continue to move forward and, you know, continue to progress in the road to recovery from this pandemic. So thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much, Manita. Thank you so much. My okay. pleasure. So I want to um, allow Jessica to speak a little bit. Um, she's here from the office of Lauren Underwood. So Jessica, do you, you want to say something? Yeah, 
Hi, yeah, good morning, everyone. My name is Jessica Biesold. I'm the Congresswoman Underwood's Outreach Director. Um, I'm so sorry the Congresswoman couldn't be here this morning. They're having a very busy day in DC, but I'm really grateful to be here with you to kind of share a few remarks on her behalf. Um, so first off, I just want to express the Congresswoman's thanks to the Quad County Urban League for organizing this event and engaging the community on this topic and everyone that's here to speak today. You know, the Congresswoman got vaccinated as soon as she could because she trusts the data and evidence that's demonstrated that the authorized vaccines are safe and effective. And she did it because, you know, she wants to hug her family and friends again, and she wants to help protect them from the COVID-19, from COVID-19 and eat at restaurants in her community and get back to doing all the things that she loves to do, just like all of you and just like hopefully everyone watching this, this video later. And all of that is possible because of the vaccines. So, you know, it's been wonderful to see vaccinated members of our community gathering together safely once again. And it's, you know, it's been great to see some of our favorite events like county fairs and outdoor concerts that are returning to our communities this summer. Um, and again, that's all possible because of the vaccine. So, so her message to everyone here and everyone who's watching this video later is if you have not already, get vaccinated and then encourage your family and friends and coworkers and neighbors to do the same. Because when people see, you know, family members and loved ones getting vaccinated, it increases their confidence levels in the vaccine. So talk about it. Um, and just if anyone has any questions about the vaccine or are hearing these kind of misconceptions that have been going around, she encourages everyone to go to vaccines.gov to get the information that you need. And then again, get the shot, protect yourself, protect your loved ones, and then together we can completely get through this pandemic. Um, so again, thank you so much for inviting us. Thank you so much um, on behalf of the Congresswoman and just continue to take good care of yourselves. Okay, thank you so much for um, being here in her place. So we do appreciate that so much. All righty. So we're going to um, go to our second speaker who is Myla. Myla is going, Myla is the assistant director at the DuPage County Health Department in Wheaton, Illinois, and that's region two. So she's going to give us information from her expertise and her experience from um, the health department there. So I'm gonna turn it over to Myla. Thank you, Barbara. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Awesome, thank you. Um, I'm gonna share my screen in just a moment, but I feel like as soon as I do that, sometimes you don't see my face. So um, I just wanted to let you know that I love to have the conversation be kind of open-ended, so don't feel bad about interrupting me. And I may ask Laura to jump in because she's actually a big part of our heart um, coalition that we're gonna talk about. So I'm happy to have her jump in. We have a, you know, a small enough group to be informal, which, which is great. Um, and in addition, I'm lucky enough to go second. So Vanita covered so much of um, the things that I think we're also experiencing here in DuPage that I'm not going to um, belabor that. I think what I'll probably do is say, us too, um, we're doing, you know, we're, we're kind of in the same boat and we wanna work together on increasing the vaccine confidence among our residents that have been really hardest hit and not only by, um, by being sick with COVID or experiencing loss, but also by some of the economic impacts too. So we're gonna talk through some of our strategies and again, um, please jump in and, uh, and let me know if you have questions. Now I'm gonna try and share my screen and we'll see uh, how, how successful I am. Let's see. All right, so hang on. All right. Here we go. Can you all see that or do you see it in presenter mode? In presenter mode. Oh, okay, hold on, let me try again. How's that? Looking good? Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and get started and um, please jump in and ask questions. I'm happy to, to have this be more conversational. So what you're looking at here is every week we have an updated slideshow um, that we make available to our municipal leaders and um, often our executive director or some of our leadership here that's been involved in the COVID response will provide this to mayors and managers, to our hospital partners and to our heart coalition um, as they meet throughout um, every month that we've been in the COVID response. 
So this is this week's information, and I've um, added a couple slides so we can talk specifically about the vaccine confidence issues. Um, this slide here, I always start with this one because it, it's a really nice reminder that we've been through pandemics before. Um, we, in recent, you know, in recent memory, it was swine flu or H1N1, depending on how you remember that experience. It, but they're all different. And we, you know, you get through them and you look back and you want to learn from what, um, what you've experienced so that the next time you go through it, we, we respond better and we're better protected. But truly, um, we do have experience with pandemics. This slide that's black and white on the left, it kind of takes you back to how vaccine, um, how vaccine clinics used to work. And today in this pandemic, we would never have a line like this, right? With people standing so close to each other and not wearing masks, um, kids would not be getting vaccinated. It would be, you know, a whole different look. Um, on the right side in those color slides, you see people getting vaccinated in all sorts of locations. They're in a pharmacy. Um, they might be in a mobile clinic. They might be at the health department um, or some other venue. Maybe they're at their work. So much different look to this pandemic and the vaccines that we're using today, um, just like in the past though, they were new. Um, we got a little bit lucky with H1N1 because people were familiar with swine flu and some of the, our, our older residents may have even had it um, and had some exposure, but that was a scary one because it really impacted pregnant women and kids um, very, you know, in a very scary way at that time. So I just like to take a step back and think about how um, this is a different time, but we will get through it. We've, we've experienced a pandemic before and um, we will we'll meet the challenges and move on. So in DuPage County, we, we have a lofty goal of, you know, of vaccinating 80% of our residents by July 1st. We're at 65% uh, this week and, of the, and that's of eligible residents. So when we first set the goal for 80%, we did that before the 12 year old group became um, eligible for vaccine. So that changed our numbers a little bit, but still a good goal. And we are working on this goal um, every day. But right now we are at 65% of eligible um, DuPage County residents have been fully vaccinated against COVID-19. So all of our goal, all of our goals is to, is to reach that herd immunity that's so important. And so as we're looking at those numbers, that's where we're really trying to go. A little specific um, information here, our seniors, that's kind of where we all got started with this was healthcare providers and seniors. We're doing really well with seniors as are most of our um, counterparts, and you can see that we have over 90% uh, vaccinated with at least one dose and 88.8% .8 fully vaccinated. So really important. We still find some seniors today that need to be vaccinated, but um, much of the work here has gone really well. Thinking about the younger group, and this is where the vaccine hesitancy and some of the concerns are a little bit different than they are in the adult group. Um, we're, we're getting there, right? We're at 51% with one dose and 36% are 39.6% with two. So lots of work to be done here. And we, what we've been talking about with this group in particular is at this point, um, as we approach July, this is the group that's going back to school. This is the group that wants in-person learning. This is the group that where transmission, um, you know, you may not see cases and the cases may be mild, not all the time, but that's what it may look like. Um, but if they're unvaccinated, this is a, you know, an area of concern for us in the fall. So parents want their kids back in school. Kids want to be doing activities and sports. Um, with the two dose vaccines, it takes about five to six weeks before you can be fully vaccinated and immune and have that benefit of the vaccine, right? So if we talk um, about dates, if you walk backwards from the start of school and if you wanna be vaccinated, let's say by the middle of August, well, that clock starts ticking in early July. So it's really important to be thinking about how we can build vaccine confidence in this group. And um, we're really excited to have the support of the pediatric um, community, especially um, from our federally qualified healthcare centers all the way through our doctors and um, nurse practitioners and folks that can help build the immunizations in this group. So this is a very busy slide, um, but we are looking in every category at how we can increase our 
vaccine confidence and our vaccinations in our communities of color, including um, our Asian, Black, and our white, and our Hispanic or Latinx communities. Um, Vanita is absolutely right. This unknown number or unreported number is difficult for us, um, all of us, to know where we stand with how we're doing. There's a lot of good reasons for why someone may have chosen that unknown or unreported um, category. And as we look at that and try to understand it, one of the conversations that we're having right now is that people may not know where they fit. And at heart, in our um, equity coalition group, what we've talked about is that our Arab American population and our Muslim community members may not feel that they have a category that they fit into. So that may account for some of the unknown. Um, some of it certainly could be that people aren't comfortable. It could be that their um, immigration status makes them uncomfortable. So whatever the case may be, those numbers are pretty large. In the race category, we have 32.7% that um, reported un uh, unknown. In the ethnicity, 58.1%. Uh, so those are some big numbers. But what we, what we do is we still try and look at every single category and say week to week, where are we seeing increases in our vaccinations and, and where are we not moving at all? Um, and you'll see that in our black community, we have moved up just a little bit, um, but it's, it's not much. Same thing in our Asian population. And then in the um, ethnicity category, um, our Latinx or Hispanic numbers are coming up a little bit. So we, we also look at the age groups and the, um, and the sex as well. But um, we're very similar, as uh, Vanita said, to having more uh, females than males vaccinated. That's, that's not unusual for us. We, we're in the same boat there. So we're working on that. Um, but this is kind of how we are looking at our, um, our improvements as we go through. This slide is just to say that we have 216 vaccine partners in DuPage County. So DuPage County is a county of nearly 1 million people, we're pretty population dense. Um, where are you gonna get your shot? So, and who's gonna give it to you? This is sort of what that breakdown looks like. You can see that pharmacy chains are by and large the biggest contributor. Um, and then we have a number of other places you can go to get your vaccine. One of the areas that we've been trying to focus on um, in the more recent months is making sure that our homebound folks can get vaccinated. So we have 13 fire departments that are participating in our homebound effort. The health department is linking those that need um, vaccine to a homebound provider through our EMS uh, system. We also have home health agencies, pharmacies, and health systems that are doing um, homebound vaccinations as well. So that's something that's across our county, what we've been working to close that gap. And Vanita talked about this too. So really the future of where our um, vaccine efforts are going, especially to bring equitable vaccinations to all of our community members is how do we reach people where they are? Meet them with on-site demand, community-based clinics. Can we go to churches? Um, can we work with the state to bring some of their equity clinics closer to where people are working or living? Um, so we have, an, we have a couple ways of doing that. We have, a, you know, we, we utilize the state of Illinois programs as much as we can. And then we also have some of our own programs where we are using either just a mobile effort where we'll go into a grocery store or into a business um, and set up a clinic actually in the building. And then we have a van program where we're bringing a van and doing vaccinations at parks. Um, this week we work with the Wheaton Police Department to do some um, vaccines at a local park during one of their police um, community events. So. And that was something that we did with World Relief. So a number of different um, opportunities here. And we know that we're maybe going to see some small gains, maybe two people or 20 people. Um, but each one of those clinics brings an opportunity for somebody to get vaccinated to keep not only themselves safe, but um, as we talked about a little bit earlier, their family members too. So we're talking about the Heart Coalition. This is a, um, a group of folks, and I'm going to, if Laura wants to unmute and say anything, I'm happy to have her um, jump in here. But back in the beginning of the pandemic, we had three of our um, large partners here in DuPage. The, um, we had the DuPage Health Coalition, the Health Department, and the, um, our safety net provider, which is the, um, the Federation for Human Reform. 
come together and chair this group that is called HEART, which stands for Health Equity and Access Response Team. And our goal here is a partnership um, to bring a countywide voice for health equity and access across the county um, to make sure that all of our residents can reach the highest level of health possible. We have come together monthly or actually in some months more frequently since October. We have a steering committee of more than 40 representatives, including um, probably the most impressive um, part of this is that we have new partners really now. Um, at the health department, sometimes I think we were, we're in a little bit of our own bubble and we need to get outside of that. And this Heart Coalition has allowed us um, to give a voice to people that we don't get to talk to and create some new partnerships. Laura, if you wanna jump in and just say anything about you know, the overall efforts, that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think, um, like you mentioned, the the group was like an amazing um, coalition of different uh, community-based organizations that have access to different types of populations that maybe um, like the health department would not um, directly know or, or have contacts with. And so it has been great um, to be able to uh, work all together. Uh, for example, we had a, a very interesting survey. And so um, it wasn't just the health department putting it out there. It was um, us reaching into the communities and asking people individually to fill it up so that we would know um, what those um, issues that made people hesitant to get the vaccine. And this was before the vaccine was widely available. So uh, the work is really helpful because we can, we can have an, an ear on the ground. Thank you, Lord. It's great to have your participation. Um, we, you know, like um, like Will County, we we did do that survey that Laura mentioned, and I'll tell you that it it came at a time when people were either unable to get the vaccine or um, really anxious about um, making that decision to get vaccinated because um, long term care workers were getting vaccinated at that time, and they were being first, um, and you know, healthcare providers and things like that. And the interesting part about that survey is that we, we got about 3,700 responses. It was available in seven languages. Um, and we saw right away, not only that we were able to formulate messages about the responses to the survey, who, you know, questions like, who do you get your trusted information from? Um, where do you get it? Social media, what, what kind of social media? Do you, you know, use TV? Do you look at any uh, print newspapers? We got a lot of good information. Um, some of the other questions looked at, you know, why do you want to get vaccinated? Um, a lot of a lot of our communities of of color and our our communities where we've had a lot of impact. The number one reason for them was they wanted to get back to work. Um, that that's a real important issue for us because you have to bring vaccine and you have to at the time also provide PPE and necessary testing so that people can go to work. Um, if they have barriers to those things, they can't work. Um, that's a lot different than wanting to, you know, go to a concert, right? Those are two very different motivations. So we talked about um, how we can build vaccine confidence so that people did not have to have a, such a difficult decision come to them um, with such anxiety. So the survey was very important. I will say also that we, we did pretty well with our um, Latinx response. We got, I think, 600 responses in Spanish, which was fantastic. Um, in, in addition to the people that responded in English and, and identified as Latinx, but we did not do real well with our Black African American population. So I think some of that says, if I'm nervous about a vaccine or I, I'm not confident in the vaccine, I also might not want to take that survey because we do know that we had a lot of our leaders um, from the heart group. We had the NAACP and a lot of our church leaders share that survey and we still didn't do as well as we had hoped. So our um, next step to that is to do a focus group specifically for our African American community, um, for our Arab American community. And then we're looking at how we're going to address, I'm going to say youth, but I think that's going to kind of come at young adults. So we're going to look at that in three separate focus groups that will be happening um, in the months of July and August. Okay, great. I think Ms. Voss has a question. Oh, sure. Oh, I see your hand now. <laughs> yes, I do. Um, so I'm just wondering, um, 
your utilization of the the van for the pop-ups in the neighborhoods mm -hmm. um how many times has the van gone out and you know just kind of what's been kind of the input and the, the feedback that you received with that mobile sure. van so the mobile van arrived uh last week so it's been out you know a couple of times but prior to that we were doing pop-up clinics in grocery stores and businesses um you know some large businesses like fedex some factories, um, and then some small businesses like landscaping um, companies and things like that. So the, you know, the hard part, you know, for all, and you guys, you tell me if you feel differently, but I think that the hard part for us is, it, this isn't the field of dreams, right? We're not gonna build it and they will come. Um, just bringing a van isn't going to get it done just showing up and going to a grocery store um, isn't going to get it done. So let's face it, as healthcare providers, we spent a lot of time telling people they need a medical home. And, and a medical home is really important. And now here we are telling them you should go get a, you know, uh, immunization with somebody you don't know in a location that you normally would not get a medical, you know, service in. Um, so there's advantages and disadvantages, but what we've learned is that we need to do the work ahead of time. So we need to reach out to our WIC recipients and do like a blast text that says, hey, we're going to be at such and such apartment complex, look for the van, and um, we're going to provide immunizations. We need to reach out to the teachers at the daycare um, facilities in the area and say, um, could you circulate this flyer for us? Um, especially if we've done their vaccinations, because now they, you know, have a good sense of trust with us. And we're fortunate that we do have unbelievable partners with the heart group. So when um, our social services folks share a flyer or a link, we, you know, people feel better about that. Um, we've been trying to provide some social media posts where people can um, add their own logos to it. So that if I'm a, you know, if I go to the AME church and they share a flyer with their logo on it, then I might say, well, I don't know, you know, I like the health department, I've never gotten a service there, but I do know that AME Church is something um, that I can trust. And by working together, we're more likely to, to do a little better. Um, and Vanita, if I'm not, just to answer your question a little bit more, um, so the vaccinations have ranged from like two to like 42 um, in, in quantity at these events. And the other takeaway that we've had really through our partnership with the DuPage Health Coalition is that we're trying to offer both um, both the one dose and the two dose vaccines instead of just the J&J &J because, you know, there's enough concern over the fact that J&J &J had a pause. Um, but there's also the issue that if you don't bring a two dose vaccine, your youth can't get vaccinated. So it you know, if, you're, if I'm going to an apartment complex, I'm only going to be able to see a certain segment of the population that may or may not be home at the time. Um, it's, if you can provide people a choice, I think it, it expands your options. So that's a new development for us, is to have the ability to bring the Pfizer um, out with us. So I'm happy to circle back with you and say if that's made an improvement. Um, and I don't know if that's been your experience too, but the, the mobile clinics have been great. Our partners have it's expanded partnerships that I think will um, be beneficial for all of us for years to come, but um, it's not enough to just be there. All righty. Um, these are, yeah, I don't want to take too much of your time, but we have a call to action. Um, this is what our three uh, charges look like. And by expanding that evidence base, this is something that we did initially, the survey was a part of that. And then the focus groups are going to be um, further um, advance our evidence base and really help us with messaging. We have this other strategy in the beginning is it was all about masking and PPE initiatives. We provided thermometers and pulse oximeters to um, some of our healthcare centers that were seeing people that were sick and needed to monitor safely at home. Um, in the beginning, if you remember, it was kind of crazy. You couldn't get a thermometer at, at one point. It was very difficult to come by some of these items. Um, same with masks. We're definitely doing better with PPE now. So then we moved into testing, treatment, and vaccine access. So we were operating two um, testing sites, two community-based testing sites 
for a while, uh, one in Villa Park and then one in Wheaton to try and accommodate both um, kind of both parts of our community and make that testing available um, really Monday through Sunday. And so between the two sites, we were able to do that. And the third, this third is um, strategy was to expand the program and practice activities for frontline workers. I wanna to get to this next uh, part here about becoming a vaccine champion. And Vanita talked about this as well. It's really important to have vaccine champions in all aspects of the community, all the way out from your, you know, if my doctor is my trusted person for health information, then I should be able to talk to my doctor. But if my person that I get my healthcare information from is my neighbor or is, you know, my pastor or is somebody at the community center that I go to, then we need to have vaccine champions in each of those areas. Um, lay people are really important in this effort. Um, and then that's not so easy because we're talking about three different vaccines, um, which is something we've never had. You know, typically when you take your child to get a vaccine, no one's asking you what brand of vaccine you want and if you want it to be one dose or two and, and that kind of thing. Um, it's, it's a lot of decisions to be made, but we wanna give people the messages where they can speak um, comfortably and share the right messages and really a consistent message whenever possible. So we built out something um, called our Vaccine Champion Campaign. And these are six of our vaccine champions. We do have a few others, but this is a, an example of some of our local leaders that have come forward to, to be recorded, um, to do a video for us to use on social media um, and in some paid media. And also to, they're kept on our YouTube channel. So you can see that link there. Um, we really feel like using social media is gonna be a big help for us and also providing these different videos so that our partners can share them too. Um, it's gonna be helpful. So Mr. Orber Davis, who's an Emmy winning um, musician has, he was the first person to do a PSA. It is um, so exciting for me as a public health person to bring music into public health, that never happens. Um, <laughs> so his video is exciting. Um, he plays the trumpet in it and he has a super positive message about the safety of the vaccine and that the science is real. So um, love his PSA. Dr. Asfar is an important member of our heart organization. She's also a leader in her community. And not only as a, a doctor, but also as a faith leader, she's just excellent to provide a message um, and has done that in English and in Urdu. So we're excited about that. Um, Diana Martinez is a leader at College of DuPage and really talks about how important it is that people can get back to the arts for their well being. Um, she's got a great message. Ms. Gilda Ross is a leader um, of a lot of our parent series. Um, our Glenbar Parent Series is pretty broad throughout the community, but she also is um, in charge of organizing a Spanish-speaking parent series and an African-American parent series for teenagers, which is amazing. So she has um, the ability to reach down to lots of parents um, and talk about how the sooner our kids can get vaccinated, the sooner they can get back to being kids. Um, and, and a little bit about the isolation that is not good for kids. And then in the middle on the bottom there, Vanessa um, does a great job of talking about why she got vaccinated. And she has a bilingual message and talks about that. Although, you know, she's a young person, she is, um, she lives with older people and she wants to see some of her relatives and she doesn't want to put them at risk. So she talks about her message. And then Mr. Um, Michael Childress, who's the president of the DuPage um, area, NAACP has been an um, kind of a phenomenal leader for us because he has given his input throughout the heart um, meetings all the way from the beginning um, and also put himself out there to do some posters and, and a message here with a video. Um, he also was still getting his vaccine. So he's been great and a tremendous leader. Vaccine basics, we talk a lot about um, why vaccine is a safer way to build protection. Um, while natural immunity provides some protection for sure, um, we don't know how long that protection lasts and the risk from severe illness and death um, by far outweighs any benefits of waiting for yourself to get that natural immunity. Um, vaccine will help protect you by building that immunity without having the risk for severe illness. We have talked a lot um, about the fertility concerns and Vanita also brought this up. So we, we have a PSA that was done by um, an OBGYN that we've, we've shared. We've 
trying to make this message um, something that people com can comfortably talk about at all levels from lay people on up. But this is a big one. It gets brought up a lot. And I think we, we need to continue to share this message and have conversations with people about it, a back and forth conversation so that they can feel comfortable after they've listened to the message and ask any questions that they have. And then lastly, our registration um, and DuPage County vaccination clinic at the fairgrounds in Wheaton is shown here on the right and our new hours are on the left. Um, you know, we have walk-in appointments available for ages 12 and up. We are, um, we also have a guardian that is required for anybody under the uh, under 18 years old. And that clinic is something that we have been sharing widely, but just know that that's only a portion of our vaccine efforts in the county. We have over 200 vaccine partners. We also have a call center. This is our regular call number. So we have representatives on the phone that can assist and answer questions. Multi-language assistant is available. And then we have a number of different resources and toolkits on our website um, in multiple languages that are available as well. And thank you so much for your time. I probably, Barbara, you probably should have cut me off because I think I went over, but thank you for letting me share and I'm happy to take questions or hang around later and, and we can discuss. No, thank you so much. Yeah, you definitely brought a lot of information. So if anybody has any questions? Okay. Well, thank you so much again for um, <clears throat> being part of what we're trying to do. Like I said, you know, definitely people such as yourself and Vanita and other people that work in the health departments and, you know, reach out to people and helping others, you know, it's critical that you guys are here with us today. So thank you so much. Um, my third speaker is, I don't want to butcher her name, but Uche Anwuta. And she is the Director of Disease Prevention from Kane County Health Department um, in Aurora, Illinois. And she is with Region 2. So I'm gonna turn it over to her. So she's gonna talk to us about um, her experiences and her recommendations as well. So thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Uche Omuta, as uh, Barbara mentioned. Thank you very much for the uh, introduction. Let me try this, uh, share my screen. Can everybody see my screen? All right. Yes. Okay, great. Okay. Um, I'm happy to uh, join my colleagues uh, to discuss uh, uh, COVID vaccination, especially among the minority population in our area. Um, I'm the Director of Health Protection at King County Health Department. So um, just a little highlight about where we are and then um, I can dive into vaccination. Currently we have about 59,000 cases of uh, COVID and over 800 deaths in King County. And we've, we've um, investigated over 300 outbreaks. Uh, currently we have four of those outbreaks still going. So we've come a long way with COVID. A lot of resources have been put into COVID. Um, I like to highlight these deaths because, um, you know, just like my colleague said, uh, just, uh, um, you know, hoping that you get a case of COVID and, and recover from it so that you build immunity uh, sometimes is not always the case because you might end up being one of those 800 uh, deaths or, uh, severe um, complications that come from the COVID infection. Uh, just looking at uh, our cases, we can see the trend in our cases. Um, um, uh, we have in uh, November, December, when we had a surge, and um, this is an earlier uh, slide up to April, we have now come down um, from there. Uh, uh, this is a breakdown of our cases in the last month between May and June. And you can see that um, while on the right hand side with our under, uh, uh, over 65 year olds um, with vaccination, the numbers have really gone down. And we're now seeing more cases among uh, the younger population, 10 to 19, 20 to 29. 
and fewer of those cases among the older population. Um, in terms of race ethnicity, uh, we had uh, um, more, more cases among the Hispanic population, but as you can see um, in May, uh, April, May, we're seeing more cases among uh, the black population. The, the case rate has increased among the black population. Um, our test positivity rate has been on the decline. Um, and this is uh, due to the effectiveness of our vaccination program. Um, just to touch a little bit on our community vaccination program, um, my colleagues also mentioned what they have in their communities. Uh, here in King County, uh, we started our community vaccination program all the way uh, since March. Uh, in addition to uh, mass vaccination clinics, we have been going into the communities and offering vaccination where the people are. Uh, we've offered vaccination at several businesses uh, with um, the uh, eligibility for vaccination dropping to age 12, we have also uh, targeted the schools, you know, before the schools closed, we, we um, scheduled um, vaccination clinics uh, at the schools and we got some really good responses there. Uh, we've worked with churches, we worked with Aurora African American Health Coalition and uh, vaccinated uh, um, at the Aurora mass vaccination site. Uh, we're targeting uh, large festivals, farmers markets, a homebound population. We're working with the VNA uh, to provide vaccination to homebound. Um, our marketing program, you know, we've reached out via social media, Facebook. Um, um, we have face bus ads that are coming out, uh, I think next month. Uh, we've had several webinars, you know, we had a um, webinar targeting the minority population. We, we had surveys uh, trying to find out uh, how to communicate uh, in a, a minority population. You know, like my colleague said, uh, it's always about who they would listen to, not necessarily how much information we put out there. So we're very mindful of that and going to people they trust. Uh, to provide that information. And we have several videos on YouTube uh, targeting uh, the different population. Um, anybody that um, require, uh, needs a vaccination program at any of our King County, anywhere in King County can contact me and I can arrange for that. We have a mobile vaccination, uh, we, we have a mobile van uh, for vaccination and we also work with uh, Illinois Department of Public Health, um, their equity program, and we've had several clinics with them up and down the county um, with great results. And, you know, we've had, especially with the schools, we had uh, several uh, vac vaccination doses administered. And uh, our, with our program, we administer we, uh, the three uh, vaccines, you know, Pfizer, uh, Moderna, and J&J. Uh, &J. So I wanted to draw our attention to, to variants, you know, people have been talking about variants in King County and uh, in, in around the country and we're not uh, different from others. We also have seen variant cases and this is the more reason why people should uh, get vaccinated because uh, the more we can increase our vaccination rate, uh, we can keep uh, variants at bay. Um, uh, at some point, you know, with uh, mutation uh, of the virus, we might end up with a, a variant strain that might be uh, too, um, that might not respond to the vaccines that we have available. So that's the reason why we're encouraging people uh, to go out and get vaccinated. And uh, just drawing our attention to hospitalization by race, uh, ethnicity, um, you can see that that more Black and, and Hispanic uh, 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 
patients who are, uh, tend to be hospitalized compared to white patients, sometimes it could be that uh, they seek help later in the process when they're already um, you know, being overwhelmed by the, the disease uh, compared to the white population. Again, uh, the more reason why we're pushing for vaccination. Um, other issues relating to disparities, um, we have uh, issues with um, physical environment, you know, income, education, discrimination, the kind of jobs that uh, people do and the housing situation that predispose us to uh, exposure to COVID virus. And I also mentioned the hospitalization and severe illness because of uh, lack of access or pre-existing -ex conditions in addition to what I just mentioned about people getting to treatment later in the progression of the illness. And um, also wanting to mention that mitigation strategies, um, uh, there's disparity in, in mitigation strategies because of occupation, you know, food insecurity, unemployment and bereavement in our community. Uh, there's hardly anybody I know that doesn't have somebody that died from COVID in our community. Um, just thinking about uh, not just the fact that uh, COVID leads to infection, uh, we also have to contend with the fact that there's what we call long COVID. So long after uh, the, um, the, the disease, uh, people are left with, you know, 23% of COVID patients develop these uh, long haul symptoms. And I listed some of those symptoms here. Uh, many people, uh, some people who had the disease as far back as March uh, have not been able to come back to normal um, life. And that is an issue. Uh, you know, this is what I like to present people who are, are vaccine hesitant is that, you know, you might end up with the disease and it's not just, you know, you're young and strong and can fight the disease, but, you know, uh, there's no way of knowing what long COVID will result from uh, that infection that you might be, um, you might end up with these conditions that will make it difficult for you to return to work or have um, employment. Additionally, other uh, post-COVID conditions like autoimmune disease, um, multi-system inflammatory disease, you know, even among children, we've seen uh, multi-system inflammatory disease uh, that could um, cause some issues, you know, uh, uh, that, that, you know, make it takes a while for recovery. So again, um, I'd rather not end up with the disease. I'd rather get vaccinated so that I don't have any of these complications. Uh, and I just put in some symptoms of the multi-inflammatory disease. Uh, and then, you know, if you're experiencing any of these warning signs, you know, so if you have these symptoms, you might want to contact your physician. But if you're experiencing these uh, warning signs, you really want to call 911 because uh, it means that uh, there's um, problems, you know, going on. And these are symptoms that you find with people who have been exposed, uh, children who have been exposed uh, to COVID, either they had an infection or they, they were exposed to somebody who had the disease. Again, I, I see on TV and everywhere, you know, why should children um, who are low risk uh, get vaccinated. Well, we don't want them to end up with MISC, uh, which is really severe. So, um, looking at, at our vaccination, uh, at this time we have vaccinated uh, over 45% of our population. Um, those 12 and over about 68% uh, of them have been vaccinated as, as of uh, yesterday, uh, June 22nd, the day before. Um, um, 
86% of our, our seniors, 65 and older, have been vaccinated and uh, fully vaccinated. And then 50% of those who are 12 plus have been fully vaccinated. So looking at breaking it down by uh, race, ethnicity, uh, about 3%, uh, 3.5% of uh, African-American population, uh, uh, th three and a half percent of our vaccinations are to African Americans who make up about six percent of our population and uh, 25 percent of our uh, vaccination is to Hispanics who make up um, 32 percent of our population. So as you can see we still have work uh, left to do. Um, I like to use this uh, slide to encourage people, if you're fully vaccinated, you don't have to wear masks, you don't have to social distance. Um, but if you are not fully vaccinated, uh, are we really uh, using these, uh, you know, masking and social distance in, in these situations where we should? Uh, somebody said that 50% um, uh, are fully vaccinated. However, we're seeing a hundred percent of people not wearing masks. So um, why put yourself at risk um, when there's a solution to this, get vaccinated so that if you find yourself in less than uh, uh, six foot social distancing or not wanting to wear masks, you're not putting yourself at risk. Um, so I have a list of these myths. Um, about COVID vaccine that I wanted to debunk, but my colleagues have already uh, addressed some of them. So um, I had I had people ask, you know, uh, do you uh, vaccinate people? Uh, do they shed the virus? The answer is they don't because there's no virus, uh, COVID nineteen virus, in uh, the vaccine that we use, uh, and you don't have an electromagnetic field at the site of vaccination, which is something that people have, have um, talked about in, in the past. That is totally not true. Um, those who get vaccinated absolutely can have a baby one day. Um, I know my colleague had talked about um, people who want to wait and see. And I can tell you that we started in December uh, to administer these vaccines and there's been several studies before that, before December, and even since then, you know, um, uh, several uh, pregnant women have been vaccinated and they've been fine. Uh, so if there's anything, it would have would have been able to find it out by now. Um, uh, COVID nineteen vaccine will not alter your DNA because uh, mRNA vaccines don't get into your DNA. They're two different things. Um, after getting COVID-19 uh, vaccine, no, you will not test positive for, for COVID-19 because as I mentioned, there is no uh, COVID-19 virus in the vaccine. Uh, can a COVID-19 vaccine make me sick with COVID-19? Again, no, for the same reason. Uh, being near someone who received the COVID-19 vaccine will not affect your menstrual cycle. There's been um, uh, people who have shown that their menstrual cycle uh, changed a little bit temporarily uh, from getting vac uh, vaccinated. Um, there's nothing that shows that it's a permanent uh, uh, change. Um, if I have recovered from COVID-19, do I still have to get vaccinated? Absolutely. Um, because when you do get vaccinated for COVID-19, the immunity lasts longer. We don't know how, how long natural immunity lasts. So we encourage everybody, as soon as you've been released from isolation, to go ahead and get vaccinated. The only reason why you would wait 90 days before getting vaccinated uh, is if you were treated with monoclonal antibodies. Otherwise, as soon as you're released from isolation, please go ahead and get vaccinated. Can I get COVID if I have underlying conditions? Absolutely, because the risk 
of developing COVID is higher than the, the risk of you having uh, uh, conditions, uh, uh, side effects of COVID-19. Um, there's very few, very few uh, conditions that will preclude you from getting vaccinated. And most of it is a uh, severe allergy. Um, can I get COVID vaccine while I'm still sick with COVID? We don't, we, when you're under isolation, we don't want you going to get your, uh, get vaccinated because you will be exposing those who are giving you the vaccine uh, to COVID. So uh, we ask that you wait till your isolation period is over before you go uh, and get vaccinated. Uh, luciferase in COVID vaccine. Uh, so luciferase is something that we see in uh, the firefly. It is not included in COVID vaccines. And uh, there has been some information about aborted fetus and J and J vaccine. Uh, J and J vaccine used uh, stem cells um, to produce uh, the vaccine, but there was no aborted fetus that was part of this vaccine. This is the same stem cell line uh, from the 60s that they're still using. You know, you keep growing those cells and, you know, you keep using them. These cells have been maintained uh, for several years. Uh, there was no fetus that was aborted for uh, the J and J vaccine. And um, just to, in terms of effectiveness, I've, I've heard people ask, well, um, it's not quite 100% uh, uh, effective. And I can tell you uh, the flu vaccine is about 44% uh, effective um, against the flu, and we still use it. Uh, chicken pox is 92%, but Moderna is 94% and Pfizer is 95%. So definitely, uh, uh, my colleague that mentioned that um, this is the first time we have a choice of which vaccine to take. And I think sometimes, you know, it's like send, uh, taking a child to a candy store, which one do I pick? Um, definitely all three of them are very effective against COVID-19. I can skip this one. Um, so where can I get information about vaccination? Here in King County, we have all our information at www.kinvax.org. Uh, we have press releases that we, we send out, you know, for certain community vaccination events. And anyone 12 years and over can get vaccinated. Our children 12 to 17 will, can only get vaccinated. Uh, uh, Pfizer is the only one that they can use, but all adults 18 and over can get any of the three vac vaccines and all three of them are effective. My name is Randy Ryder. I've been uh, with African American Men in Unity since 2007. I did eight years in the military from uh, 1975 to uh, 1982. I opted to take the Johnson and Johnson shot because it was only one time. I didn't have to get poked twice. No matter which one you take, take one. Because we can't come out of this until we're all vaccinated. We can't do things as individuals anymore. This is a community effort. Because what you do affects me and what I do affects you. If you're vaccinated and I'm not, then I can infect you and vice versa. Let's all participate so we can all get the freedoms that we've been enjoying for the last however long you've been alive. The restrictions that you see will continue until it's safe. And so if you're one of those people who whine about the mask, whining about not being able to go places and do things, then take the shot. Thank you. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Muta.
Let me try to pronounce your last name correctly. So we appreciate you providing that information and educating and encouraging us to get the vaccine. So thank you so much for taking the time. Barbara, could I ask her a quick question? Sure. Um, just a quick question about the 12 to 17 year olds and, and maybe about the recent information that came out about um, the myocarditis. Have, have you seen any different hesitancy or confidence questions among parents of youth um, and, and really in the young male group because of the recent news? Uh, so I have to tell you, I have twins who are 15 years old and they were the first in line once they started uh, vaccinating that age group. Um, I think we focus too much on what can happen and forget what can happen, you know, the rare chance that you have that myocarditis and it's not permanent, it is temporary. Um, you know, uh, Tylenol or one of the um, um, pain uh, medication, medications can, I'm not a physician, so I don't want to um, address that, but uh, the fact is that it's not temp it is not permanent. Um, however, the effect of COVID-19 is permanent. You know, it could last a while. So I think there's a greater risk of my child having issues from being exposed to COVID than uh, getting myocarditis uh, from a vaccination. Thank you. That myocarditis, and it's not permanent, it is temporary. Um, you know, uh, Tylenol or one of the um, um, pain uh, medication, uh, medications can, I'm not a physician, so I don't want to um, address that, but uh, the fact is that it's not temp it's, it's not permanent. Um, however, the effect of COVID-19 is permanent. You know, it could last a while. So I think there's a greater risk of my child having issues from being exposed to COVID than uh, getting myocarditis uh, from a vaccination. Thank you. Okay, great. Alrighty, um, again, thank you so much for um, you all being here. We have one last speaker, so I mean, we are um, strapped for time right now, but the last speaker that we have is Alexi um, Manjares, and she is from Health Just, I mean, Southwest Suburban Immigrant Project, and she's the Health Justice Manager. They are out of Bolingbrook, Illinois, uh, Region 7, so I'm going to turn it over to her with the amount of time that we have left. So um, again, welcome and thank you for being part of this. And Alexia, we have time on the video, so feel free to go through your entire presentation. Okay, good. Thank you. It's, it's not too long, very brief, but um, we'll move through it. Um, so hello, my name is Alexia Manjaves. I'm a community health worker with Southwest Suburban Immigrant Project in Bolingbrook. Um, we're a social impact organization that works primarily with the immigrant community in the southwest suburbs. And today we're just going to bring a few of our experiences doing this work and tying it into why it's important for us to get vaccinated. So before we start with um, a few statistics on the Latinx population, um, it is important to keep in mind that the Latinx population in Illinois is a minority. Yeah, it's one of the communities of color that has suffered disproportionately due to COVID-19. Of the 2.2 million Latinos in the state, 11% of the population was, in, was infected with COVID-19. That um, is being compared to the 5.8% of the state's 9.7 million white population. From the beginning of the pandemic, young Latinos have been especially affected, not only in the number of cases, but also in the number of deaths. According to the Latino Policy Forum, approximately 10% of the Illinois population aged 20 to 59 is Latino, yet Latinos account for 40% of COVID deaths in persons aged 20 to 59. 70% of all diagnosed cases in Latinos were in that young age range, which um, that range is all parents that are raising young children. 
So the disproportionate numbers of cases of deaths have been caused for many reasons. Um, first, many of our community members were not able to stay home because they had essential jobs. And many of these essential jobs didn't allow for the proper safety measures like PPE and the proper social distancing. Second, many of our families live in multi-generational homes. You know, we have grandma at home or uncle um, along with uh, immediate family. And third, there's little information in languages other than English. Um, other reasons are the lack of health insurance and or the fear of immigration repercussions. Um, this has caused families to de delay testing, care, and even getting the vaccination. Despite these alarming numbers, vaccine access rates have been trailing for the Latinx community since the beginning of its distribution. The Latino Policy Forum estimates that currently Latinos in Illinois have only received about 12% of total vaccine doses administered, despite them accounting um, for about 18% of the total cases in the state. The white population, meanwhile, has received about 64% of doses administered, despite accounting for 40% of the total cases. Um, this has been, played a big role in the continuing growth of cases among Latinos, especially those aged 20 to 59. And again, we just want to remember that these are just not numbers. These are real people, people fighting for their lives. Um, through our work, we have seen and heard many stories from our community on their experience during the pandemic. Uh, for example, we were able to talk to a staff member at Rush Hospital in Chicago, and they told us that at one point at the peak of the pandemic, almost all hospital beds were occupied by La someone of Latino background or Spanish speaking. Um, there's also a lot of misinformation being sent on social media, a lot of fear and anxiety, and we've heard so many doubts from our community. We were able to speak to a single mother who was debating on whether to receive the vaccine or not. Her um, fear was that she would have a severe reaction or she would have long-term neg negative effects that would lead her to the hospital. So we were able to connect her to a physician and a, a doctor so that she could relay all her worries and get informed on how specifically it would affect her. And the doctor was able to um, advise her to get vaccinated because like um, and you said, the risk of becoming seriously ill from COVID is much greater than having any severe effect to the vaccine. And then personally, um, I received my vaccine because I do have a pre-existing condition. So it was super important for me um, going out for work, um, grocery stores to be protected. Um, also for my family, my mom also has a pre-existing condition. And uh, last year I was able to become an aunt and you know, making sure I'm able to protect my small nephew who was barely getting his, you know, vaccines. Um, keeping him healthy and safe was like a main priority. And lastly, just getting the vaccine um, is a privilege. In other countries, especially um, for my, my family's from Mexico, um, people are still waiting. They have been um, administering uh, vaccines, but at a very slow rate. Um, I believe they're doing it by age groups. Um, last I heard, they were between the 40 and 50 category. So it really is a privilege to, especially now, having all these options and, you know, even being able to make an appointment for um, a same day vaccination. And lastly, I just want to share a bit of our work. Um, so these stories um, are what guides us and pushes us to do the work that we do at SSIP. SSIP firmly believes in decreasing disparities in health. So our health justice team was specifically designed to assist and provide resources for our hard to reach communities, not only for COVID-19, but other healthcare needs. Um, we have been able to provide individuals with resources such as food pantries, medical equipment. We connect them to primary care physicians and we even advocate for their unpaid um, medical bills. So if you have been affected by COVID or you have um, 
and like family members or friends, they could always reach out to us and we could connect them to the correct resources. Can even um, help them get um, a vaccination appointment and transportation if needed. And I'll add our information um, in the chat. But if you have any questions, you can reach me or someone from my team at 630-296-6755. Or you can email me directly at alexia.ssipteam at gmail.com. And again, I'll add that in the chat box. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for, uh, again, being part of what we're trying to do. So I appreciate you taking the time and um, giving that information. So thank you so much. Uh, thank everybody. Um, I will turn it over to our chief of staff, um, Elisa, but I just personally wanted to thank everyone for joining us and giving all the, the credible information that was provided. So I do appreciate that. Some things I learned a lot, and I'm hoping that other people learned a lot as well, but definitely um, we're, we're on a quest to get this pandemic, you know, taken care of and numbers reduced. So thank you all for being a part of that. So I will turn it over to Elisa right now. Thank, thank you, you, Barbara, and thank you to all of our speakers and presenters and all the information that you brought today. This has been amazing. As Barbara has already indicated, I learned, I as she did, I learned a lot. And I've been on several of the health calls that we have for our community health workers, uh, which I learned a ton of information there as well. But again, hearing from each of you has brought even another perspective, especially regarding our youth and uh, the mobile uh, vehicles that go out. And so we look to perhaps partner with each of you in some way, shape or form in order to continue to touch our black and brown communities. I Oh, and let me just say to Alexia, that those statistics are horrendous. And so we want to definitely connect with our Hispanic and Latinx communities here, especially here in Aurora, because we know we have a large population. So um, again, thank you everyone for sharing this. This video will be posted on our Facebook page. I'm not sure if it'll go on our website as well, but for sure on Facebook. And um, the videos that you shared, Vanita, the, your video, as well as Uche, your video, we will definitely include those. So, oh, yes. And then Uche, send me your link to your video so that we can definitely include those and, and post them and, and repost them and repost them so that folks can see and know that there are testimonies and the value and importance of getting a vaccination. I'm proud to say I am a vaccinated woman. <laughs> and let me just say, I got one more thing to say. I, I Don't get me on a roll. So Uche, you mentioned the post effects. I thought that was very valuable because of the fact that I think people think they get it and if they live through it, it's over, but it's not. I still don't have a total sense of smell. And I had co contracted COVID a year ago. And so it, it is very um, important. I think that's a very important point to point out is the fact that just because you recover from COVID doesn't mean you totally recover. Exactly. So again, thank you ladies for sharing this information. Hopefully you'll be able to also post this information, this, uh, this forum on your um, platforms mm -hmm. and we will be in touch Again, Theodia thanks you. She came into the office and saw the, the last portion of this. And so uh, again, I, I'll cut it off there and say thank you again from the Quad County Urban League.